Juan and Medford Massachusetts. Lived uh, for a few years in Sumble, Massachusetts. Lived uh, for quite a few years in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's where I lived when I went in the Marine Corps. When I convinced my mother to sign for me, I was 17 at the time. But what maybe really, well, Pearl Harbor was festering in all of us, I guess. Young guys in high school, we all wanted to get in very badly, and I, uh, I'm a pretty good salesman. I talked my mother into it. I don't know, my mother was, was working uh, uh, as, as a lathe operator, of all things, and my mother's not mechanically inclined at all. But she was working, and I, I remember uh, before I went in the ring, seeing her put on boots and slacks and go out to work on a midnight shift. So all those people made tremendous sacrifices. When I was in high school, I had a uh, part-time job working in a tag factory. And I replaced a young lady. Uh, she'd be on one shift, I'd be on the next. And she had a picture of a Marine in a dress blue uniform on her desk. And I would like to say that joining the Marines was 100% patriotic, but frankly, I wanted those dress blues. I think at that age, you can be very patriotic. Particularly when you see what happened to you guys, uh, the soldiers and, uh, at, at the beginning of the war. Uh, so I, I think when I went in, I wanted to go in. I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted to fight. Paris Island, uh, quite an experience, three months of hell. You can imagine a young guy getting off a train in Yamasee, South Carolina, and uh, going up against these rebel drill instructors. Uh, they made life miserable for three months, but I tell you, when you came out of there, you're a hell of a lot bigger and better man than you were when you went in there. Because you're all, you're all suffering a little bit. Uh, I remember the first, the first night in, in uh, Paris Island. They had some Quonset huts and double bunk beds so I was on the top. And we're all, uh, we've been roughed up all day long. And when the lights went out, all you could hear is whimpering. Some guys really wanted to be home. And that was Paris Island. You're marching every place, you're running every place. You're trained in uh, bayonets, you're trained in hand grenades. Then you go to a rifle range and you spend a great deal of time on the rifle range until you qualify. So that w when you come out of there, you're, you're prepared for combat. And I, I remember I was smoking at the time and I threw a cigarette on the ground, stepped on it, and I felt a hand on my shoulder. And it was a drill instructor with a pith helmet on. I wanted to know if that was my cigarette. I said, yeah. And he said, you don't know how to dispose of a cigarette. And I said, frankly, I don't. And he said, well, you open the paper up and you, you spring the uh, tobacco out and you roll up the paper in a little ball and find some place to throw it. Now, the fact that you didn't know how to do that, he said, we are going to assign you, when you get through work, about 6 o'clock at night, you'll be washing the floors in the mess hall for one full week. I never, I didn't want to smoke again, never want to throw one away. What you really liked about it were the people that were really treating you rough, Really, before the end of three months, they turned out to be your best friends and, and, and people who would like right by your side going into combat. When I, when I um, get out of boot camp, I think because of my age, they sent me to uh, Texas, to Hitchcock Naval Air Station uh, for guard duty. And I think it was sort of nice to keep me out of combat for a little while, but it only lasted about four months and then I was sent out to New River, North Carolina, and that's where so your last stop before you go to the South Pacific. And that's where I got trained. They are really training to get overseas, and they uh, trained me there as a heavy water-cooled machine gunner. It's, it's a uh, heavy water-cooled chamber of a machine gun on a tripod, and it's a team of three that, that fire it. There's one guy that, when, when you're marching, he'll carry the tripod, the other guy will carry the barrel, and the other guy will carry the ammunition. Well, I had one guy who's a pro football player, a huge man, and he ended up carrying the ammunition. And the heaviest part of the machine gun that I was assigned to was a barrel, and I weighed 142 pounds at the time, so I got stuck carrying the barrel. We are very anxious. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've been trained and trained and trained, and now we're going through, was another six weeks of training in the river, 
and we knew we were just shipping out of it, and we were going to be shipping out from there, which we did. We shipped out of there from Norfolk, Virginia, and we went through the Panama Canal, and we headed for the South Pacific. I went there with the 3rd Marine Division and the 4th Marines as a machine gun. But when I got there, I found that they were actually creating the 1st Provision Marine Brigade and they took my outfit, or took me, and placed me with an artillery group, the 15th Marines. And they made me a Ford Observer with the, uh, so I wasn't going to use my machine gun at all. But in fact, they made me a Ford Observer and a telephone man. We weren't, we weren't, our job was to keep communications going between the Ford Observer Post and the battery of, of artillery. So I, I thought it was a little mixed up. I didn't fight it because I, I wasn't really keen to be a heavy water cool machine gunner anyway. And the artillery sounded good to me, and uh, although the Ford Observer places you up in front of the infantry, which wasn't exactly where I wanted to be, but that's where I ended up. Well, we, we were very, or, apprehensive at that time. Because we, we got, uh, when we got to Guadalcanal, I've got guys that just left Bougainville, heavy combat, and they sit in the tent and they start talking to you, and what can we expect, you know? I know that when, I, when they made me a uh, Ford Observer, I got to the uh, battery, uh, and the, they said, no, your tent is the last tent in the row, and I, I figured I was gonna be with a 105 howitzers way the hell back someplace, but instead, when I walked in that tent, there were guys with a growth of beard, sharpening their knives, and I said, hi, what is, what's this? He said, we're Ford Observers, and I said, I think I'm in for some trouble here. But uh, that's, uh, Ford Observers were a tough, tough bunch of guys. The Japanese were uh, very clever at knowing this was a communication wire going through, and they'd, they would cut it and uh, just, am wait to ambush you if you came down to fix it. So that, that was a dangerous part of the job. We got on an Alice team, we were, we were heading out for our combat. Didn't know we were going to Guam. We finally found out we were going to Guam. And we were, it was about a three day trip. Uh, and we were, we were we were arranged to, to be there for three days aboard the ship. Uh, come to find out, they did reinforce the island of Saipan. That campaign was going on at the time. And our guys were taking a beating in Saipan. And we got orders to stay out at sea in case they needed us on Saipan. And it was hard to understand. We stayed at sea on an LST for 31 days. We're supposed to be there for three days. And uh, everything we ran shot of, we ran shot of clothes, we ran shot of you know, the food, we did pretty well. Uh, and then just towards when we were ready to hit the hit uh, uh, Guam, they brought us to, uh, and, and we talked, uh, and let us get off the LST, stretch our legs, get back on, and then we went into combat. We would, we would have invaded any place just to get off that LST. But the, the, the problem we had, we started. Uh, a lot of guys got sick. There was a tremendous amount of dysentery on board, and that was just passing on. We were running out of clothes. In fact, I ran out of clothes completely because we had a we had a situation where the only way you could wash your clothes is to tie them to a rope, to get on the fantail of the ship, and throw them over, drag them through the water, and and they would they would they would be washed out. In fact, the salt made them so white and so we, we, we looked as though we all had Panama suits on by the time, but they're not green dungarees. But I do remember, and I think it's one of the funniest things that happened to me over there, I tied what few remaining clothes I had, and I threw the line over, and I saw it going out to sea. I didn't tie it to the back of the fantail. There I was without clothes. Uh, so that, that was, uh, when I hit the beach, on, on Guam, I had, all I had was what I had on, and it was a pair of shorts and a and a t-shirt and a and a navy helmet. When, when you're ready to hit the beach, uh, we'll see you see our planes come in strafing and bombing, and, and the uh, battle wagons lobbing huge artillery onto the beaches. 
and it really made you feel pretty secure. We had so much power going for us, but they were, the Japanese would evade us. Uh, they hid in the caves, and if we got us what we threw at them, they'd come out crawling again. You know? With the invasion of Guam, we got hit hard on the beach. Uh, we had a very difficult time getting in because of the obstacles they put up, because of the, the, the guns, the hidden caves, and the artillery. So we had a very difficult time getting in uh, to Guam. Uh, it was uh, a situation, though, where we actually had an objective to take an airfield the first day we were in there. And we secured the airfield, no trouble. But we would get dug in like, the first night. And we went so fast to, to take this airfield over, we left a lot of Japanese behind. And they, they stayed low until night, until it got dark. And they tried to get back to their lines, so they were coming through our lines. And, it, and they, uh, they really killed a lot of our Marines uh, with bayonet fighting, uh, and, and uh, the, the Marines uh, were just popping their hole. And we find that the Japanese, and we knew it early on, they would get drunk. They, we could hear them laughing and, and singing, and, and we knew we were going to get a Banzai raid. And the Banzai raid, they used to take their rifle with a bayonet. They didn't even lock the rifle. They weren't interested in shooting it. They wanted to use the bayonet. And uh, so it was, it was a tough part of the campaign, particularly at the beginning, because we left a lot of Japanese behind, and they wanted to get back to their own troops. We would probably get into a shell crater three or four Marines, and, uh, and it would be pretty good coverage rather than digging a foxhole, but we'd have a telephone line coming into the foxhole, and the Japanese would raid again after, uh, at night, so they'd see a telephone line, they'd follow it through, when they come to a shell crater, they'd say there's gotta be some Marines in there, they'd start lobbing grenades and that sort of thing, so uh, we've, uh, I remember waking up, and not waking up, but looking up and seeing a Japanese helmet with head of very strange shape to it. So three Japanese helmets holding a wire, looking at a wire hole. So that's how close you could come to it. They, they, they supplied us with, with some foxhole weapons, like a Ryzen submachine gun. And uh, you just take them out with a Ryzen submachine gun, or uh, before they throw a grenade in your hole. You know? that's, that you did come face to face with the fanatic. They were terrible. They were the worst. Uh, when, when you look back on what they had done prior to the time we got there, when they invaded, when they went into China and raped and bayoneted and beheaded the Jap Chinese, and they would do the same to the Marines if they could get a hold of them. So they were fanatical, and they were—I have to say—they were—they were a fantastic soldier. They, they were—they were great soldiers. We, we got a lot of enjoyment out of taking over. We, we, we actually took over a Marine barracks that was there before the Japanese invaded. And we managed to get an American flag up on the Marine barracks, and we we're very proud of that. It was July when we were in Guam, and it, 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 was, it was hot and humid. Uh, it never seemed to bother us, though, for some reason. We, we were continuously taking salt pills, and uh, it did bother me because I picked up malaria. And along with all the heat and everything else, uh, now you have to be uh, treating yourself with malaria. The expression we used to, we felt pretty salty when you get back and, and uh, we'd had a tough campaign. Now we had all these new recruits coming on, new uh, replacements coming in. We felt pretty, we, we could tell those guys what it was all about, you know. And that, that, uh, but, and, and you did, you, you uh, and then once again you seemed to, to have bonded with, with several guys that you'd go anywhere with them. And, and uh, you were brothers. You're, you're depending on each other tremendously. Uh, it's like back to back. And, and you're watching over him, he's watching over you. So there's a, there's a, a real friendship that builds up and a real dependency that builds up because uh, you're only as good as the guy you're in the foxhole with. Oh, you were awfully close uh, you, because you're in a foxhole together, God, that's just, your, your back's against his and you're gonna save each other, you know, that type of thing. doing the same duties on Okinawa that I'd be doing on Guam. But we didn't know what we were going to get into on Okinawa. That was the, really the last campaign of the war in the South Pacific. 
and we, it was gonna, we wanted to get that island to get the airstrip so we could get to Japan. So we knew that they'd be fiercely fighting us on Okinawa. That, that was the last stop for us. Uh, and uh, when we invaded it, uh, it was amazing. We, the first day, we, we went as far as we wanted with no resistance at all. A couple of little machine gunners, or no artillery, no nothing. We said, we're getting sucked in here, I think. You know, but, we, but then it turned out to be probably one of the bloodiest campaigns in the South Pacific after that. Because we were on Okinawa for 83 days. You know, 83 days of continuous combat. Uh, so that even though it, uh, it seemed easy at first, it, it got terrible before you get to it. They protected the areas they wanted to protect. There was a peninsula up the north. We hit it right in the middle of the island. And then, then we had to go north, but when we went north, we got hit with everything. And then, of course, they hit a, a, right in the middle of the island, south. They had everything bearing down on us, so that uh, the only, only time, they did let us in, and uh, from there on out, we paid for it. You, you ran out of everything, which, which was a problem. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, there, the temperatures were humid also. Uh, I, I know that I, I ran into the Japanese barbed wire and ripped my leg, and between the flies, and uh, infections. I, I, I didn't have that leg cured or cleared up for two or three months after I left Okinawa. I mean, that, that, so if you've got cut or anything over there, you're in trouble. Uh, we had rashes uh, that were very difficult to live with. It rained like crazy over there. We'd, we'd sleep in mud occasionally. So we, we had all, all the tough spots. So it was uh, one thing I'll mention about Okinawa, you, you think of the things that stick with you when outstanding things that happen here. Uh, they have a Yontian airfield on, on uh, Okinawa and they had a situation where we surrounded the airfield and we had gun emplacements, we had, we're all set and a Japanese plane flew in, didn't realize the airfield was taken, landed. Well, they, were, they were told us, cease fire, do not fire, let them get out of the plane. He got out of the plane, started walking just as though he was going over to a clubhouse, and one guy opened up, and then everybody opened up. So. It was, it was something that really surprised us because we didn't know we had such a thing and, and uh, the destruction was, was something that really amazed all of us. Tremendous sense of relief of course we're all saying we're going home, this is going to be it. And of course that didn't turn out to be the case with me. Uh, when Okinawa, when we uh, finally finished the campaign, we went back to Guam as a rest area. And from Guam, we were told we're going to northern China. And it was, I was sort of, sort of excited about going to northern China. I thought I was going home, but they said we're going to Tsingtao, China, and we're going to disarm the Japanese, which I was really looking forward to. After all we've done uh, with our combat with these guys, and we're gonna have an opportunity to disarm them in China where they had done so much damage. We, uh, we, were, we were lined up. Uh, uh, and they, the Japanese, thousands of them, and they had their rifles, and they went over to stack their rifles, giving their rifles up. And then the Japanese officers would actually turn in their swords. And one of the unfortunate parts for us, we were all standing at attention for about two hours while this was going on. But it was such a welcome sight to see what, what these guys have been doing to us and what we know they've done to other people, to see them passing in their arms and they were humiliated, and it was good. We, we, uh, it was quite an experience, uh, Tsingtao, China. When they put us up in Tsingtao, they put my outfit up in the Tsingtao Brewery. Now, so if you're familiar with Tsingtao beer, it's probably one of the best beers in the world. And we had cases and cases and cases of beer. We could never run out of beer. Or they, they, it probably wasn't the best place for us to be, but it was very enjoyable. We, yeah, it's Sing Tao Brewery.
but we went home and we, we uh, actually ended up on Treasure Island. And it was uh, uh, very, around Christmas time, a little later than Christmas time. And when we uh, got into Treasure Island, they put us in these barracks. And it happened to be New Year's Eve that we actually uh, got settled there. And New Year's Eve, we were quarantined. We couldn't go anywhere. And we couldn't even have a beer. I remember I was so upset that we heard all this laughing and joking and music, women laughing. And we found out that they had a German prisoner of war base there and that the Red Cross were giving them a New Year's Eve party. And here we were coming back and we couldn't even have a beer. I remember, you know, you had, you had visions uh, while you were over there. God, when this is over, we're going to have confetti flown on us. We're going to have women running up kissing us and welcome home. I remember, geez, I got, to, I got to get a late train out of Bainbridge, so I didn't get to the Boston area until, until about one o'clock in the morning. And I got on a, on a uh, subway to Harvard Square, Cambridge, because I lived in that area. I remember walking through Harvard Square with a sea bag over my shoulder, two o'clock in the morning, and nobody even said, welcome home. You know? And I said, Jesus, after all of this, I, remember, I'm, I was sad. And uh, I think that was probably the you know, the, most, well, the one thing that bothered me the most about three years in the Marine Corps. Things had changed. I remember I mentioned that having a sea bag on my shoulder and, and walking through Abbott Square, they had a Briggs Music store there. And I, the first time I saw a television. And they had a television going in the window, a little bit of one. God and I stood there for about 10 minutes just saying, my God, how do they do that? You know? <laughs> so uh, things had changed. and. Uh, and it's funny, you, uh, you're very nervous about many things when you get home. Uh, uh, you lose a lot of your confidence as far as, I, I had a girlfriend, but not a serious girlfriend, but I remember uh, I, my first date, I called her and I was going to her house and when I got there, I rang the bell and my mother came out and she said, Bruce, it's so good to see you. Carolyn's in here, come on in, she's got some friends, she's having a little party. That's all I had to hear, and I said, no, I don't, I don't want to go to a party. Would you just tell her that I'm here? And, and she said, no, I definitely want you to come in. And I remember saying to the mother, well, if you don't mind, I'm just going to stay here and fool around for a while. <laughs> and uh, I, I just met her for a few minutes, said hello, and left. But you, you, you've lost a lot of uh, uh, communication, you might say, with other people when you were over there. And when you came back, it was a little awkward. I remember they had what they call a 20-a-week club. And that they gave us 20 bucks a week for doing nothing. It just bought a lot of beer. <laughs> and they did that for about six months, I think. Um, I guess, you know, being overseas, your mother's probably thought, will I ever see him again? So uh, it was a wonderful moment for her, a wonderful moment for me. I hadn't graduated from high school. I left uh, in my senior year. So we went back in a veteran's class for high school. And I gave us a bunch of guys that, for three or four years have been in the armed services and we're sitting in the back room with little kids running around ready to graduate from high school and we did and then I used the GI Bill uh, to go to college they paid the whole thing uh, got through college and uh, I think uh, between that and other things that the government did for us uh, it was it was really payback time it was it was great and I didn't I didn't have that many I didn't have any buddies from Boston, you might say. And uh, these guys are spread out, California and Texas and Florida. And you know when you first got home, you had a couple of phone calls and then maybe a, a, a drop off a note once in a while. But then they're gone, you know, you, uh, you don't have them. And it's a strange thing. Uh, I think my wife would tell you that when I was discharged in 1946, for 56 years, I don't think I ever mentioned the Marine Corps to my wife, for my children. Uh, it's just something that never was discussed. And then all of a sudden, I found the Marine Corps League here in Natick. And I, I started talking to buddies. I found guys who were in the same division with me. And I was enjoying myself so much. You know, my wife said, you know, for 56 years, you've never even mentioned the Marine Corps. Now, you, you can't leave it alone. <laughs> and, and I did. I, I got involved with these guys. And uh, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, I, I thought, in a way, I thought everybody was a Marine, you know, when I got discharged, so it wasn't a big thing. But I find out today, you know, 56 years later, hey, listen, 
combat marine was something during World War II, and you ought to be proud of it, and, and you ought to talk about it, and you ought to mix up with the guys. I've had many, many upsets during my life, but nothing bothered me. Uh, it didn't bother me that much because I had always remembered worse. And, I, and as far as endurance and training is concerned, God, I, they stretched me out more than anybody's ever been stretched. So that I think it helped me a lot. Uh, it helped me a lot as far as motivating me to do to, to accomplish things uh, that maybe I wouldn't have if I was in the Marine Corps. Or, uh, the, the experiences you had makes everything else seem easy after that. I think if I'd want anybody to take anything from it, it would be that they should they should consider protecting our country the way we did. That uh, this is a marvelous, marvelous country, and it's worth fighting for.